In this last article, uh, the first point that we make is that uh, within this universe we see highly complex forms. Now we've already discussed in some detail the point that one cannot really understand how such forms could come into being, uh, starting with uh, material elements in a chaotic state and then allowing these elements to interact with one another according to physical laws of the kind understood in modern science. Uh, so, basically the reason that you wouldn't expect a process like that to produce highly specific complex forms, such as the structures found in living organisms and so on, is that the uh, laws of physics are essentially quite simple in nature. They involve attraction and repulsion and things like that. So, how could they produce a highly elaborate, uh, detailed, complex structure? They could produce something that is complicated but haphazard. For example, if you just throw together a bunch of tinker toy parts, you can produce some complicated glob of some sort. Uh, that could be done according to simple laws and random steps. But, say, to put together the tinker toy parts into a model of a windmill, let's say, in which the veins turn around and are connected by a pulley to a motor and so forth, uh, you couldn't expect that just by joining pieces at random, according to, this, uh, to some simple rules, that uh, you would produce something like that. So we've made that argument. So, we do find in the universe that there are highly complex structures. So, the question is, what can one say about the origin of these things? Well, it would seem a basic conclusion that comes both from a consideration of science and mathematics and also uh, from a consideration of the Vedic literatures, is that the only thing that can generate complexity is something even more complex. Ultimately, to deal with complex things, you have to operate on a complex level. You can't get uh, complex uh, order coming out of something simpler or something chaotic. So, since there is complex order in the universe, that would mean that there has to be complex order in the cause behind the universe. So one thing that has been suggested from time to time is that, well, the cause behind the universe is just the universe itself. Matter is eternal. Uh, so the buck stops there. Because if one says, uh, what is the origin of matter? And one says, well, God is the origin of matter. Then somebody can say, well, what is the origin of God? And then if you say, well, God has no origin. He's self-sustaining. He's the original cause. Then somebody can say, well, wait a minute. Why not just say that matter is self-sustaining and that that's the original cause? In fact, this is often said. That's a point Carl Sagan made in his uh, famous Cosmos series. He said, well, why go uh, a further step to God? Because once you go to God, you're going to say that God has no further cause. So why not just go as far as matter and say that matter has no further cause? So, the answer to that is, that we see that material forms tend to disintegrate. So matter does not have, uh, is not of such a nature that it can preserve complicated form for eternity, or even for very long. You can impose complex form on a lump of matter, just as a sculptor can take some clay, which by nature is shapeless, and he can form that into a statue. But in due course of time, the statue is going to disintegrate. That's the nature of material interactions. And it will disintegrate not into a new and better statue. It's not that if you build a statue and you, you let time pass, that eventually that's going to form a more beautiful statue or something like that. Instead, it's just going to fall to pieces. Uh, eventually, it will be just formless clay again. And that's true of any material form. And indeed, from the a study of the laws of physics, you can see that that must it must happen that way. Disorder and uh, chaos tend to increase in a system 
governed by the, the laws of physics. So it couldn't be that this form exists eternally in matter. Unless, of course, you postulate a special kind of matter somewhere, which is different from the matter we know, and which permanently records this form. Uh, so just for the, the fun of it, we suggested here, well, maybe there's something like that in the universe somewhere. Uh, and this is a sort of cosmic information source. So you could have your complex form eternally stored up there. But then you'd have to have some procedure for going from the form stored up in this eternal information source to uh, various material objects. You'd have to have some process uh, transmitting the information, like a computer readout. If you have the, the eternal read-only memory, <laughs> you'd have to have some readout system. So it wouldn't be enough just to posit something static that exists somewhere and has all this information in it. It would have to be active. It would have to have uh, ways and means of taking that information and manifesting different things. So you'd have to be imagining a sort of um, eternal operating entity which stores up vast quantities of information. So that's like following the science fiction type vein here. You might say there's uh, an Adi robot which stores up all this information. So uh, at that point, one can bring in the question of consciousness. Now, we discussed consciousness quite a bit. And we uh, concluded that consciousness cannot be understood in material terms. Specifically by material terms, we mean quantitative terms, in terms of what can be measured or described in terms of numbers or geometrical concepts such as points and lines and so forth. So consciousness is something that cannot be understood in those terms, and yet consciousness exists. We know that we're conscious. So one can go through that whole discussion. But if consciousness exists, what can you say about the origin of consciousness? Now, some people will want to say, well, consciousness emerges into existence at a certain point in time when matter has attained a certain state of organization. So they try to advance a theory like this. But the problem with that theory is that since we can't understand consciousness in terms of matter, we have no reason to suppose that consciousness is going to come into being no matter what matter does. Let's say that matter does gradually develop into a certain state of organization. Why should consciousness ever come into the picture? Uh, since we can't understand it at all in terms of matter. So this idea is essentially uh, fallacious. And in fact, if you want to posit that consciousness comes into being at a certain phase of material development, then you need some kind of law or some kind of operating procedure which will say, okay, now at this point consciousness comes in. But whatever that law or that procedure or that entity is that does that, it has to at least have uh, consciousness itself or something as good as consciousness. Otherwise, how can it manifest consciousness? If that is simply a material thing, then once again, since consciousness can't even be understood in terms of material things, it couldn't manifest consciousness. So you either have to have something that can produce consciousness, and we don't know what it is, which eternally exists, or you could say that consciousness eternally exists. Either way, you're positing something very remarkable that has no place in modern science. So perhaps the simplest idea is to just say, well, consciousness might eternally exist. In any event, that agrees with the, the Vedic conception, and it doesn't disagree with anything that we can see or observe. So we propose here, let us suppose that consciousness is always existing. Now, in practice, we see that consciousness tends to be associated with what we call intelligent action. Now, by action, I'm referring to movement of material things now. Uh, and there's such a thing as intelligent action. 
That is, if you see a person doing certain things, talking or building something and so on and so forth, you call that intelligent action. Whereas if you just see water in a river flowing downstream or something like that, that's action, but you wouldn't call it intelligent. Or if you see just a plant growing, you wouldn't call that intelligent. But at least in human beings, we tend to see that consciousness is associated with intelligent action. And when a person becomes unconscious, the intelligent action stops. So there seems to be a connection. In fact, we understand that consciousness is the source, ultimately, of the actions. That is, if I perform some intelligent action, it's because within my conscious mind, I desire to do that. Desire is something which is a feature of consciousness. Uh, it makes no sense to speak of an unconscious desire, for example. What would an unconscious desire be? <laughs> because desire is something you feel. So, uh, now that since we have posited this universal entity which stores up information and creates things using that information, that is certainly intelligent action. So is it so unreasonable to suppose that this universal entity would be conscious? Uh, well, you can't say that we've proven in any sense that that would have to be, but it certainly makes sense. And it doesn't contradict anything that we know. So one can suppose that this universal entity which stores up vast amounts of information and is, is eternally existing is also conscious. Uh, so, and that would mean also that it can't be understood in material terms. Of course, we've already said that since it eternally stores up information and matter couldn't do that. But anyway, what it amounts to is that practically we have some kind of an idea of God at this point on the basis of reasoning. So, if you want to really criticize this presentation, you can say that nothing has been proven here. Uh, all we've done is sketch out a reasonable possibility. But still, it is reasonable. And there are limits to what you can prove anyway. If one studies the whole question of what is provable, you'll see that you can only prove something if you start with some assumptions. If you don't start with any assumptions, you can never prove anything. But the assumptions themselves are not proven. By definition, the assumptions are what you start with. So that means that any proof can always be questioned, because someone can always go back to the assumptions and say, well, wait a minute, you didn't prove that. And if you add a proof for your assumptions, that has to be based on still earlier assumptions. And then they can go back and say, you didn't prove that. Well, this is just the nature of proof. There are limits to what you can prove. So, uh, but one can make a, pro a plausible and reasonable case that there is some kind of eternally existent intelligent entity which stores up vast amounts of information. Or once we say this is an intelligent en entity, one wouldn't call it information, one would call it knowledge. So, an eternally existing entity that has a vast amount of knowledge and is using that knowledge to create things in the material world. So that's a reasonable conclusion, just based on thinking about things and observing things. So, of course, the uh, approach in the Vedic literature ultimately is that we don't propose to prove everything uh, because we recognize that ultimately you can't prove anything. But since that we have this idea that complex knowledge or information ultimately has to come from a complex source, you can't generate it out of nothing, the Vedic idea is to obtain knowledge about very complex and deep subject matter from this original source. So, by doing some reasoning, we've come to the conclusion that it's quite plausible that such an original source could exist. It's a very reasonable thing. And we understand that real knowledge can only be obtained from that source. Just as all the different forms manifested within the material world have to come from that source, so knowledge about the nature of that source, or what it's really like, would also have to come from that source. Just by sitting here and reasoning, we're not going to ultimately be able to come to solid answers. <laughs>
Uh, but by reasoning, we can conclude that we'd have to somehow link up with that source to obtain the information. Uh, so the Vedic process is to use the descending process for obtaining knowledge. Now, of course, for the descending process to work, you have to have the cooperation of this eternally existing being who has all the knowledge. So the descending process is based on the idea of surrender to the Supreme. One depends on the mercy of the Supreme. Because if this supreme intelligent being is not willing to provide knowledge to us, then we're certainly not going to get any knowledge from that being. We're not in a position to force the hand of the supreme being. So, in this sense, the Vedic approach is very different from the approach in modern science. The whole idea in modern science is that we're going to take nature by storm. Uh, we will conquer nature. The scientist is saying that uh, using our clever reasoning and our different experimental techniques, we will ask questions of nature in such a way that we will force nature to answer our questions. We will extract knowledge out of uh, the material world. So that's the scientific approach. Or at least that's the, the predominant approach of modern science. Well, that is completely the opposite of the Vedic approach. So the idea in the Vedic approach is that since ultimately we want to find out about this supreme being who is manifesting all these different things in the material world, because after all, if all these different manifestations are coming from a supreme being, if we ultimately want to understand what these manifestations are, we have to understand the source that they're coming from. What's the use of just studying the manifestations if we don't understand that ultimate source? Because then we won't really understand what's going on. And we can only understand that source by the mercy of that source. If that source is so powerful as, as we are proposing, then there's no way you can force that ultimate source to reveal itself. So the Vedic system is based on the idea of surrender to the Supreme Lord.